I personally strongly believe that every day we should make people look around and wonder, what the F is she wearing? Hey, okay, welcome. If you are new to this channel, I'm currently working on transferring all of my original world building videos over from my main channel with some updates and retcons, plus Q&A from the previous comment sections. This is the second world building video I did, which focused on trying to organize my ideas of how to develop a cohesive wardrobe for one of my fantasy races. So onto the original video, and you can skip to this time frame to jump ahead to the new content. In my last video about world building, I discussed making a conlang for one of my fictional races. However, as the comments section pointed out, I'm a bit of a linguistics ignoramus and really need to study the IPA. Here, educate yourself! Which I am doing, but in the meantime, I wanted to make a video discussing something I do know a little bit about. Clothes. I think a culture's clothing is somewhat of an overlooked element of world building, and I think it's kind of obvious why, because a lot of world building has to do with writing, and with writing you don't see the clothes, so why bother? It seems like most authors tend to just default to fantasy medieval, which really works perfectly for some stories. But I absolutely love it when creators develop a culture's style. My favorite examples of this done well are Avatar and Game of Thrones. They both have fantastic styles that really help to define the cultures and give a lot of realism to their world building, as well as showing individual characters' art. So a tiny bit of background about this fantasy race before we get started. I have tentatively called them the Nauticans, and they are very near human. They can breathe underwater, so they kind of bridge the gap, living along the coastlines and rivers and lakes, kind of part of both worlds. However, as part of the story, about a century ago there was an empire situated in the northeast that started to expand, pushing west. As the empire expanded, the Nauticans were slowly pushed further and further west along the coastlines and to the islands. Eventually, Eventually they had to completely abandon all of their surface strongholds and built a hidden city deep below the ocean. Today I'm going to walk you through how I developed a style of clothing unique to this culture that lives below the sea. To start I made this grid. The circle in the middle represents the elements of the style that will be common to every one of the culture. The wedges along the circle will represent elements of the style that will be different depending on your class and status within the society. The areas I've identified as contrast within the society will be the differences between female clothing, male clothing, upper class clothing versus lower class clothing, formal clothing versus work clothes, clothing worn by adults versus clothing worn by children, the differences in clothes worn during the cold weather versus hot weather, and the differences between clothes that are more modern styled or more traditional styles. This is the basic breakdown I came up with, but it may be different for you depending on the culture you are trying to think of styles for. For instance, you may have a more primitive style that doesn't have modern clothes, all they have is traditional. Or you may have a culture that has more gender neutral clothing, in which case you might not have the male and female divide. Or in my case, a city under the water wouldn't have much in the way of weather or climate change, so the summer-winter category isn't going to be super relevant. There will also be categories that overlap. So for instance, my upper class category will overlap with the formal category, and the lower class category will overlap with the work clothes category. However, I do think there are enough differences between these two categories that it is still necessary to keep them separate. I looked at a wide range of sources for inspiration, and I really recommend Pinterest for this. Specifically, if you type in traditional clothing and then just start inserting the names of countries, you'll come up with a lot of really interesting stuff. The baseline that I started with was this pair of modernized harem pants. I thought the free range of movement they would provide would be good for a culture with a lot of daily contact with water. I was stumped for a while on what the top should look like until I stumbled across a picture of Thai traditional clothing. I was struck by the way the skirts are wrapped in a way that already looks like the pants that I'd been drawing, and I loved the wrapped tops, and specifically the way they use pleating to kind of make this waterfall effect. I had already decided they would use a lot of braids to keep their hair tied back, but researching that led me to the broader range of traditional African jewelry and hairstyling and then beadwork and the prints, and I really just wanted to incorporate all of that because I'd already decided that metal would be important and it's a really cool aesthetic that I thought combined with the traditional Thai aesthetic would be really interesting and unique. For ideas on how to incorporate even heavier metal jewelry, I looked to traditional Middle Eastern clothing. They use wide belts and hair ornaments and cuff bracelets and all kinds of bangles, very ornamentally, and, and I definitely wanted to use that look. 
I also want to include an element of modern swimwear, basically because I think it's an interesting idea for a fantasy race to actually have a practical use for bikinis. There will also be a small element of steampunk, and that is because the architecture of the underwater city is going to be very heavily steampunk inspired, and it makes sense that that would leach into the clothing styles a little bit. So combining all of these inspirations and more, I came up with a baseline of the gathered pants, wrapped tops, and leather moccasins. The idea behind this is that in the middle of the ocean there would be very few sources of leather, so they would use metalwork wherever they could and basically reserve leather for the shoes and military use. The wrapped layers of clothing will be held in place through use of metal pins and brooches. This can be large ornamental pins like the antique cat pins, it could be small metal clips, or they could use elaborate goldwork brooches. For the main fabric they use, I've invented something that for now I'm calling sea silk. It has a lot of the same properties and qualities as regular silk, but it is derived from an underwater plant instead of silkworms. It can be roughly woven by hand to come up with something similar to dupioni silk, or it can be finely woven by machine to make a fabric like silk chiffon. The natural undyed color of the fibers is a light pearl gray. The Nauticans have also invented a bronze-colored metal that will never rust or be negatively affected by being submerged in water. It's primarily used in their architecture, but they also use it for their weapons, jewelry, and other elements of clothing. The last thing I want to cover with this culture's clothing baseline is the fabric prints, and to create the fabric prints I had to come up with the iconography. A list of iconography is a really useful thing to develop for any culture, not just for clothing. They can use it for calligraphy, art, architecture, religious symbolism, government symbolism, tribal symbolism, house crests or sigils. The iconography is just basically a list of the things that you see around you in everyday life in the natural world, really elemental things, and you can really use it to flesh out your culture in any artistic realm. While working on this list, I noticed that several of the elements on it really boiled down to the same basic shape, repeating over and over. So I'm not sure how I'm going to use that yet. I might use that in developing an overall symbol for the Nauticans. It's just something interesting I noticed to keep in mind. Okay, so back to the fabric prints. As I already mentioned, the natural color of sea silk is a light pearl gray. Because their city is very isolated and doesn't have access to trade, they only have three dye colors available, blue, yellow, and red. Just because they have all of the primary colors doesn't mean they can mix those to make any color. Because when you're working with natural dyes versus acrylic paint, for instance, Things don't always mix quite well, and you would end up with just a muddled brown a lot of the time. Of these dyes, blue is the most readily available and cheapest to buy. Almost everyone can afford it. Yellow is only slightly more expensive, and red is very rare, and therefore an upper class and special occasion dye. They can also make a wide variety of designs by painting it to the sea silk instead of just soaking it. So here's a simple traditional design using seashells, and this one would be using fins. This design would be based off of netting. This design could represent scales, or be flipped upside down to represent waves. This one would break from tradition by using triangles to represent the waves. Here's another triangular wave print. This print uses a simple traditional fish design, while this print uses a more geometric, modernized design for fish. Adding a yellow print automatically classes your wardrobe up. Or you could use yellow and blue to create even more complicated, elaborate designs, like this one using waves and bubble designs. This interlocking design uses the geometric fish. A fabric could be made more expensive by first soaking it in yellow dye and then painting it with blue. Or even more expensive if you painted it with red. However, this would still be cheaper than a fabric that had been dyed solid red because even though it's more time consuming to paint, it uses less of the rare red dye. Costs could also be cut by using a larger portion of blue in the design and just small red highlights. But the most expensive high class fabrics would be rich with designs and use all available dye colors. So now, finally, I can take all of these elements, the gathered drapey pants, the wrapped tops, the leather moccasins, the metal, the silk, the prints, and I can come up with my cultural baseline. This is the most standardized, basic look that anyone in the culture might wear, and I can use it to extrapolate those contrasts that I mentioned earlier, such as male and female, upper class, lower class, older and younger, modern, traditional, all of those things, I can come up with the variations now that I know what the standard is. And I think I'm gonna have to cut it off here. This video is getting a little bit longer than I planned, so I'm gonna have to break it down into a couple parts. Uh, the next part will deal with the contrasts and specifically I'm going to work on the male female and upper class lower class divide because I think those are the two biggest and most important contrasts for most cultures but for this one definitely. So don't worry there's more to come. A lot more to come.
All right, so this video isn't nearly as bad as the last one, and there is very little that I want to retcon or change. And further developments and evolutions to the Nautican clothing will probably fit better in the later videos. However, I feel like most of my problems in life come from not explaining myself well enough, so maybe for this video I'll tell you about the origin of the Nauticans and how they've evolved. In real life, not in the story. <laughs> Now, most people I've talked to started world building as children. Nobody told them to or taught them how, it was just innate. Microcosms of potential realities existing in their minds alone. That's how it was for me. I remember reading the Chronicles of Narnia for the first time in third or fourth grade and thinking, I want Narnia, but I want my Narnia. What would my Narnia look like? World building was just a series of vague, indefinable dreams until about middle school when I began to think about it with more intent and to come up with stories. Now, a lot of world builders seem to constantly spawn new worlds. That is never how I've been. I only ever have had one world. But that one world has continued to grow and expand and evolve and change right alongside me. The first thing I thought when I asked myself, what would my Narnia look like? Was, well, it has to have mermaids. But my mermaids would be different, I decided. At least they'd be different from any mermaids I'd encountered in kids media at that point. Now, are you ready for some really bad kid art? I can't believe I'm about to put this on the internet. <laughs> no! <laughs> I decided that my mermaids would roam the seas and hunt and fish. And there would be flying people. There had to be flying people. And there would be land people. Basically humans, but special. I wasn't sure how. And then there would be three people groups. Land, sea, and air. And then I saw a really beautiful painting of a zebra one time, so I drew a zebra centaur and I threw that in there and then everything just kind of spiraled out of control. Now the problem I had with mermaids and storytelling though was how limited they were. They could only be involved in stories happening at sea. The next stage in their evolution came about age 13 when my family started going on canoe trips in Missouri each summer. Now I had never been to the ocean and I'm still not big on beaches. Maybe it's just a Midwestern thing, but the Ozarks, man. Have you ever been to the Ozarks? It spoke to my soul. The peace of sitting in a canoe, watching nature drift past, it awakened my imagination like nothing had before or has since. I would look out at the green river, then down over the edge of the canoe. The water was crystal clear. You could see gently drifting aquatic plants anchored to the rocks at the bottom. You could see fish of all sizes darting past from the tiniest of minnows to big old catfish. I could see one fishtail, large larger than the rest, flicking smoothly inches below the surface. I could see the sun glinting across the scales, the hair swirling in the current. I could picture her leather bodice and leather half gloves with webbing, a bone knife belted to her waist. And suddenly, my world didn't just have mermaids, it also had freshwater river mermaids. Every year we went canoeing again, and every year I saw more. I saw the river mermaid tending the aquatic plants in rows along the riverbed. They became edible plants, and in the shallows she farmed rice. I saw more river mermaids and men, collecting fish from woven traps. I saw them climbing the rocky cliffs with just the strength of their arms, sitting on the ledges as we passed, braiding back their hair to keep it from tangling in the water. Their children played and jumped in the river, tails shifting shades of silvers, blues, and greens. They loved the little waterfalls and rivulets of water dripping from the hillside, the dense mosses growing atop the rocks, the heavy mist rolling across the river every morning. They would lie with spears at the edge of the river, waiting for deer and other game to come down from the forest for a drink. The birds swooping low over the river to steal fish would be their enemies, and thus I realized that the winged people and the river mermaids might not get along with each other. The mermaids obviously lived in the natural caves dotting the cliffs, and I wondered if maybe they carved the caves out further, creating networks unseen by the outside eye. Maybe the entrances to their cave systems were deep in the trenches alongside each cliff formation. Maybe they even built water wheels and channels under the river, taking advantage of the current to pressurize and control the water levels in their homes. Maybe they lived along these networks in the rivers and streams, but every year they would come together to the king in his castle perched at the top of a mighty waterfall. However, the problem with all of these beautiful images of river mermaids was how little they would be able to take part in any story. They had more potential than saltwater mermaids, being at least inland, but they were still rooted to the rivers and lakes. If I had a quest, there would never be a mermaid on the team. So eventually I realized that there had to be some way for them to grow legs and walk on land. The exact nature of this shifted a lot. Was it magical or biological? Could they change back and forth at will? How long would the change take? At first I thought they might change at will. Then I decided it would be more interesting if it was biological and they had no control over it. 
Maybe they changed back and forth in accordance with the moon, like other cycles. Take your pick. Or maybe they only changed once or twice a year, migrating upstream and then back to the ocean like salmon. Or maybe it would be different for each individual. They might spend only one month a year as a mermaid, or they might change every other week. But the more stories I wrote with them as characters, the more they needed to interact on equal footing <laughs> with the human and winged people. Eventually, I realized that the only solution was to evolve them into a completely separate species from mermaids. I settled on the format that I described in the Nautican Biology video, where they begin life as mermaids but grow legs at one point and then never change back. But even that idea is in flux. I might change my mind at some point, or introduce a new magical technology that allows them to gain control over their metamorphosis again. And some might choose to become river mermaids once more. Anyways, what was this video about? Right, clothes. <laughs> So yes, when I originally imagined them, it was with leather, light armor type bodices, jerkins, and gauntlets. The more human they became, the more their clothing shifted. When I came up with the idea for a steampunk underwater city, I realized that even if they lived in the ocean, they would prefer to be dry most of the time, but clothing that could convert to swimwear would still be necessary. My first conceptualization was this. Braided hair with metal beads, a bra held up by a metal necklace. Over this, the Nautican wore a loose, thin wrapped dress. Leather leggings, leather moccasins, an elaborate metal belt, and other metal jewelry such as bangles and earrings. At this point, I shifted her gills to behind her ears, a la Waterworld. By the way, I know this movie is memeably dumb, but I was a kid when I saw it and I loved it. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. <laughs> Actually, that might be where my insistence for a metal city comes from. <laughs> the next iteration, a few years later, was something like this. A lot of similarities, but let us examine them. The combination necklace and bra was still there, and also underpants. The leather moccasins remained, and some metal jewelry, though I decided at some point that little bangles woven in at the base of the braids was essential and I stand by that. The main difference was what she wore over top. I draw a lot of my pants pulled and gathered to the side for some reason, so I decided on a loose pair of pants gathered over to the side and then tied down below the knee with a wrapped cord. Over this, she would wear a thin, loose tunic, similar to the last one, with the belt drawing in the waist. I'm not sure, but I think those boho kimonos were in fashion when I drew that. Another shirt option might be a leather vest or a bodice. Maybe the vest and the kimonos could even be layered together somehow, but I never explored the idea thoroughly enough to figure it out. Start a world building YouTube channel. Number one benefit, actually making yourself organize vague thoughts into cohesive developed ideas. And then the third and final iteration I came up with was in order to make the original video. Some things never changed. The predilection for metal jewelry, the underclothing and the moccasins, and the baggy overclothes. I originally intended the baggy overclothes only to be worn while on land and then removed for swimming, but I never really said that. But I started shifting some of the bagginess to wrapped clothing, because depending on how often you have to submerge, it gets impractical. The central idea is in the pants. I mostly drew them loose and baggy in the videos because I thought they looked cooler that way, but in reality they would probably mostly be kept tied down below the knee and allowed to hang loosely in the thighs and hips for ease of movement. The men probably wouldn't wear anything on the top while swimming, and the women could wrap their tops tighter with less drapey bits. But again, the amount of time you spent swimming would vary depending on who you are, where you live, what your job is, and what your lifestyle's like. Now, to the comments section. There were many, many, many lovely complimentary comments on the video, but there were also useful questions and critiques that made me look deeper into different aspects. By far, the number one comment was about the use of baggy clothing of any sort underwater. I think partly that I just didn't explain myself well, you know, with the clothing being reduced and tightened for swimming and then mostly only baggy on land. The only consistently baggy element is the top of the pants, and I'm sorry Sorry, I have to disagree with you. Yes, tight clothing is better, but tight clothing like we have today relies on heavily mechanized knits with spandex. Tight clothing that doesn't stretch is not something I think you'd want to wear underwater. Look at what people wore to the beach in the Victorian and Edwardian eras. The clothing was baggy in some places and tightened down in others very strategically. Number two, not all fibers behave equally when soaked with water. My original idea was tight leather leggings because fine leather can be tanned to be very soft and stretchy. But have you ever handled wet leather? <laughs> like, have you ever wiped down a car with a real leather chamois? It becomes very dense, heavy, and stiff. I just couldn't see it working well. Woven fabric, such as silk, on the other hand, soaks up very little water. With woven fabric, you could cut a pair of leggings on the bias for a bit of stretch, but I don't think it would be enough or give your legs a full range of movement. I really think baggy pants would be more practical, at least in the essential, like, hip areas. Silk pants would maintain their mobility and wouldn't add that much drag or weight. So on that one, you have failed to change my mind. 
Sea silk does exist, but it's made from shells. Okay, this. This is probably my all-time favorite comment, because when I started putting up world building videos, I was like, but what if other people have better ideas than me? And this comment made me realize that, yes, sometimes other people will have better ideas than me, but that's a good thing. When I made that video, I hadn't really thought much about where the silk came from, other than sea plant fiber. I kind of pictured some underwater plant that could be dried out and thrashed like linen. But this is so much better. Okay, brief Wikipedia description. Sea silk is an extremely fine, rare, and valuable fabric that is made from the long silky filaments, or byssus, secreted by the gland in the foot of pen shells. In particular, pina nobisus. The shell, which is sometimes almost a meter long, adheres itself to the rocks with a tuft of very strong, thin fibers. The bissi, or filaments, are spun, and when treated with lemon juice, turn a golden color, which never fades. The cloth produced from these filaments can be woven even more finely than silk, and is extremely light and warm. It was said that a pair of women's gloves made from the fabric could fit into half of a walnut shell, and a pair of stockings in a snuff box. In addition, pina nobilis is also sometimes gathered for its flesh, as food, and occasionally has pearls of fair quality. So, perhaps the Nautikins farmed these clams, and then over centuries and millennia of crop selection, the clams have grown to an enormous size and produce even more silk than real-world Pina nobilis do. In addition, they also produce meat and pearls, so bonus! Now, I like the gray, so maybe my clam fibers are more of a dark gray, and when bleached, they're brought more to of a pearl gray, the shade of which would depend on the soaking time and intensity. Blue and red and gold dyes might also be used in conjunction with this, a la the original video. Next comment. Leather can be made from seal skin, shark skin, and skin from some fish. Okay, good point. I think that I knew that at one time, but I completely forgot. I mean, I have literally seen manta ray skins at Tandy's. So yes, nauticans at sea have a selection of leather to choose from, but I still think they would mainly use it for shoes, armor, and probably belting and strapping, because sea silk is readily available and much more practical for most things. Let's see. There was this comment chain that I don't want to discuss, because the topic will come up in later videos. I would worry about the heaviness of metal jewelry if they are constantly swimming around. Eh, I'm not worried. There isn't that much, and like the clothes, which can be wrapped tighter or looser depending on if you need to swim that day, I think the jewelry would vary based on a person's station and activities. But the hair bangles and the necklace bras, those are staying. Bronze also doesn't rust. Good point, and it still works. The Nautican bronze is supposed to be special with a slight magical element, basically discovering a new mineral deep under the ocean and finding that it makes their bronze much better and stronger and more durable. So that all still works, and it makes sense why they would have been using bronze in the first place if it doesn't rust. How do they make their metal stuff underwater? If the forges are indoors, how does the ventilation work? And isn't bronze a soft metal? Okay, one, the soft works because the magical element would strengthen it and make it more mysterious to the mainland people. Two, the forges are indoors, but ventilation is a problem. It might be that the forging is done away from the city in a shallower location, possibly off the coast of some island. Then ventilation pipes could be built to the island and fresh air pumped in and maintained that way. And actually, I haven't done as much work on the city yet, but this this might be employed there too. I know that it's built on the ruins of a previous civilization, a sunken island with a lot of Lost City of Atlantis vibes, but it is also close to an underwater mountain range that rises up into an island chain further on. So it's possible that massive pipes are built all the way between the city and the islands. And that open air entrance would be one major point of vulnerability that they'd need to protect. And yes, to the thread below that comment, they mine in the underwater mountain ranges. They probably aren't even on the exact ocean floor as that depth would be dark, cold, pressurized, and all around inhospitable. I think they would mostly want to stick to underwater ranges and shelves. And then to this comment, none of my races are meant to be evolved. They are all meant to be genetically created with a magical factor. So I don't think that would apply except for the fish part of their DNA. But even then, I think something like flashiness would be more of a subtle quirk, something innate. And it would work with their love of metal jewelry. How susceptible are they to sunburns? Uh, I think I went into this in another video, but very. That is one reason for preferring to wear wrapped clothing that can be tightened for swimming or loosened and adjusted to cover more skin once out in the open. And then these two comments, which I can interpret like four different ways depending on how salty I'm feeling today. <laughs> there are a lot of new ideas I've had for the actual clothing, and they will fit better with the other clothing videos. But I think this worked, going over a bit more of the foundation of the Nautikins, so you'll better understand my goals in the future. Wow, that went longer than I planned. <laughs> um, I'm gonna see you next time. <laughs>
let's see, Thursday night, maybe I could get it done in time for Saturday. If not, it's just gonna have to wait till next week. I don't know, maybe the new channel, I'll just like put them out whenever I get them done. Maybe I won't bother with Saturdays, but I should, we'll see.